And Read Aloud Revival is the podcast and online community I host. And that came out of just me reading aloud with my kids so much during our homeschool years. And then realizing that not only do they get all these academic benefits, but they're like the relationship bonding, like the same thing that you're always talking about with games and play is homeschooling is about relationships. So reading aloud, it just felt like it was nourishing our relationships in this really awesome way. So I got very excited about it. A lot of those things like multiplication tables or vocabulary, a lot of those things were just like naturally would decay in students. And I thought that maybe there would be an easier way to learn some of that stuff to form a more solid like academic foundation. And if you could do it through play and like games, I use the example with Monopoly a lot. And when you have, but when you ask someone who hasn't even played, you know, Monopoly in 20 years, they know what color boardwalk is. They know how much it costs. They can tell you probably some of the other properties trying to grab those opportunities in a game and link them to essential skills and knowledge is something that I don't think a lot of games try to do. What <laughs> so is your I, favorite childhood game or toy? I like Legos. I like Sim City. I think that uh, the ones that I have the fondest memories of though now are games. I would organize games of tag and like Ghost in the Graveyard and whatnot in my lawn and around the schoolyard, which I actually still do today, actually. I like, just Locally, like I run a once a week tag game for all local kids. Amazing. And, there's something about this. Uh, this is a great. This ever you, you should quote me on this and use this against me. There's something wonderful about being hunted, that just is an experience that can really not be experienced anywhere else in any other way. And uh, for games, I have these really fond memories. And of the last thing I kind of jotted down is to become a student of your team and look at what they are loving, and then dive in with them. So I have played Fortnite. I have made TikTok videos. I mean, so like fun. diving into what they're doing and not being afraid of looking stupid. <laughs> I have watched an entire season of an anime television show because my daughter loves it. And the great thing about that is it's not just play at the time you're watching TV, but it carries into other things. I can now bring in those characters when we're talking about a book. Like, oh, this character in this book is acting just like Deku in your anime. And it just allows us to connect with them and to bring that fun and that play into our homeschool, into our parenting. I always loved science, but I didn't know it, but I thought scientifically. So I remember we visited my grandma and my mom pointed out a house where the sunflowers were taller than the house. And I was like, I, how did they do that? And she said, they collected the seeds from the biggest sunflowers and planted those. And so now look how big they are. And I was just like, I have to do that. And so I started doing it with Cosmo seeds in my backyard when I was like late elementary. And by the time I graduated from high school, I ended up doing the, not just the biggest, but the weirdest. And I didn't know I was doing genetics until I started learning genetics. And then I was like, oh, that's actually science. I thought I was just playing with flowers. Everybody said that to us all along. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard to believe when you're mm -hmm. sitting down with an eight-year-old and they still can't read, or you're sitting down with a nine-year-old and there's a worksheet that has volume <laughs> on yeah. it. And they're looking at you like you're crazy. And that's why I think it's fun that we're able to have these conversations because uh, not only is it weird to come full circle and be the mom that's saying the same thing that all the other moms told me 10 years ago, but um, I at least want to put some evidence behind it so that you can believe it or at least allow yourself to hope that it's true as you progress, especially on the days where your kid's resistant and isn't doing much, especially on the weeks where it hasn't really looked very schooly in your house. If the first thing that helps is you have plenty of time. Like even with my youngest, we still have stuff where I'm like, wow, he is so behind for ninth grade. And there's a lot of good reasons for that. It's not an assessment of anyone's ability at this point. It's just reality. But then I also look at it and say, and I have three and a half years to be able to get him caught up on those things if we need to. There's plenty of time. And it's so weird that that's my headspace because when he was 10, I felt like there wasn't enough time. Like the hourglass was running out. I felt so much more pressured when he was younger. And so I'm super conscious of someone that might be listening to us who has a seven-year-old right. and they're panicking. I totally get that. 
I think it takes uh, time for us to learn as the homeschool mom that it is okay. And you do need some experience under your belt to go, yeah, we didn't do that one time and it totally, it didn't make any difference anyway. So I feel more confident making a decision to just let the worksheet go and go out and jump on the trampoline. Like little by little, I feel like it comes together for us too as mom. So just hang in there. Yeah, I have three right. boys now, ages 10, eight, and one. Uh, this is our fifth year of homeschooling. I had a buddy who I met through a stay-at-home dad group that I was running and he was homeschooling and always prodding me like, Hey, you could do this. You should do it. So that was already in the back of my head. When we moved, I started homeschooling and then it was like, Hey, this is great. Let's not go back. My buddy was giving me curriculum ideas and catalogs and stuff and going through it was just like, Oh no, there's so much. What do I do? But one thing I knew was that I have learned so much through games and not through my school experience. I learned so much. I can just sit and think of all the things that I know, maybe like useless trivia type stuff or whatever, but a lot of things that I know were from games. I wanted to use that. So I started searching for like using games in school and I ran into the My Little Poppies site. I binged like the entire homeschool sisters podcast before <laughs> I left work. Cause I had a lot of time to listen to podcasts at work. I think I listened to the game school episode first. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, Oh, wow. I like a lot of the things that these ladies are saying. Let's just listen to the whole podcast. You guys really guided me to mixing and matching a bunch of different things. And we haven't looked back I've since. I've just been then. so grateful for the community for keeping game schooling and fun and play top of mind for me because I can tend towards trying to be efficient by <laughs> taking a by the book approach and open and go and with curriculum. And ultimately, that isn't the most efficient method for our homeschool because we really find that the games help us all to feel connected and to learn more efficiently and effective definitely in the long and short run. <laughs> That's wonderful. And we love our founding members. Yeah. What could I possibly mess up? It's kindergarten, low stakes here. Let's give it a shot and see what happens. And if it doesn't work out, I'll just march our little selves in there and register her. And nine years later, we have never marched any of ourselves in to do that. And I didn't know then that my girls were going to have similar, they're slightly different, but similar struggles that I had with reading because I didn't know why I struggled with reading. And it, so we went through quite a bit there trying to break the code and how is it that these super smart kids just can't seem to read? And then we had the testing done and that was when like everything opened up and I realized, oh my goodness, this is why there is a reason for this. So we didn't homeschool because we were neurodivergent, but I do know from the public school perspective, there is a reason why they need kids to fit in these boxes. You've got all of these kids to manage. I put kids in boxes. It was the right thing to do at the time. And when I looked at my oldest daughter and realized the box that she was going to have to be put in, even prior to knowing about the dyslexia or that she was going to struggle with reading, I was afraid of who she is having to be squished confined and it would be necessary. And I just didn't want the teachers to not understand her and think that she was troublesome or any of that. And in fact, she's just super curious and really active and she wants to know why all the things. And frankly, there just isn't time in a school setting. So no, I did not see it coming. And when you and I talked about this, like your unexpected homeschooler, never in a million years. If you had told me 10 years ago, we have this, we're in year nine now. If you had told me 10 years ago, I would be homeschooling. I would have laughed directly in your face. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to our live Q&A. We didn't get any questions this month, so I thought that I would ask the kids questions, and then if you wanted to ask some questions, we could do that too. Welcome to the Never Bored Learning March Q&A. I invited my littlest buddy on today for a minute. He's going to have a cameo in the beginning because... We got a lot of questions in the first one, which is from Lisa is on D and D and I don't feel equipped to talk about D and D when I have an in-house expert right here. So he's going to help us with that one. I have a bunch of questions this month, so I'm going to try to go through as quickly as possible. The idea behind our new playbooks is that they are basically lazy unit study. They're on a topic. 
They can be used for a wide variety of ages and there's a lot to them so that you can pick the rabbit trails that work for you. There's a lot here, but it's easily accessible. While we include game recommendations and play resources and things like that, there's nothing in here that you have to purchase. And even if you're not going to the library, you can still scan the QR code here and see the book read aloud. Or you can scan here and get the whole playlist. Our playbook this month is on exploring the seven continents, and it's set up very much like the book from December, which was on winter. One of the things we didn't want with this was for it to feel like it's something that you have to do. Mm -hmm. You start here and then you end there. We want it to be playful and fun. So it's whatever sparks your kids interest. And maybe your kids are really into online games. And this page right here is all you do this month. And that's totally fine. I want it to be something that inspires and an easy way to learn together based on what you're interested in. We have a calendar of all our upcoming events and we'll talk about this after. Because we're a play-based group, we start off with play and game school resources. These are just things that you might have around the house. So you can get some ideas for things that might work to play with geography. And then these are some additional ways that you could play. So when we were talking about some of the resources that we have here, like the map placemats, which helped my kids learn geography when they were teeny tiny, you could make these at home. So just having it in here as I need to buy that, you could print off a map and Mm -hmm. laminate it and use it for this month with the kids. Then we include a game list of games that work on geography in either an overt or stealthy way. We highlight four of them here, and then we have an additional list here. Then we have continent go fish. A lot of people might think my kids are too old for go fish, but this is a go fish with tons of stealth learning through Google earth. Let me go and show the cards first. Cause it will make yeah. it easier to understand. You want a set of four. So you would print four of each of these pages. First page has a picture of each continent and the word. I like to link the pictures and put the word on because it's good for kids that are early readers or pre-readers just to see the language. So then we have a page of marks and historical places on a continent. So there's one page that has eight cards that you would print four times for the continent of Asia. And then this is Europe and Africa. For our rabbit trails, we have QR codes for each of the continents and each of the landmarks or locations so that you can take your phone and scan and go to Google Earth. And if you scan Mount Fuji or the Taj Mahal, you will actually see it through Google Earth and you can explore. It makes it more memorable for your kids because they're not just looking at a picture of Easter Island and the structures there, but they're actually seeing it in real life. It makes geography come to life. And then we have book recommendations. These are some of our favorite geography picture books, and you can scan the bottom of the page to read more about each book that's featured here. These are some nonfiction reference type books. Because I have trouble picking my favorite books, I have to include (laughs) a lot more. You can scan the QR code down here and read more about each of these titles. Then we have a play challenge just so we can hold ourselves accountable. I know a lot of people like to print them out and put them on the fridge and just make sure that they are actually playing a little bit every day. And then we go into the extension activities and, um, Google Earth is a big theme this month. My kids are much more savvy with Google Earth than I am. (laughs) So I've linked a few tutorials if this is new to you. And then highlighted some features that are on there. And then we have some videos here. We try to get a wide variety. So there's some for younger kids. There's some for older kids. We've created playlists of each location in each game. So there's a seven continents playlist on YouTube. And then there's a wonders of the world playlist. And it We've included more videos there than what you would get if you scanned the individual QR code. Then we have a science, technology, art, math area with videos and playlists. Then for a hands-on activity, we have a treasure map and you can go through and identify the parts of a map. And then we have language art videos, which as I mentioned before, a lot of the books that are in our book list, I went through and found as many as I could to have a playlist on YouTube. So we've highlighted those here. I think we have something like 35 videos. So you could watch one a day throughout the month and just learn geography. And we have poetry from around the world and writing prompts. We have a word search. 
And then we have just for fun. This month I included letterboxing and geocaching are two things that your kids could get into that are super fun and they don't require a lot in terms of what you need. There's probably letterboxes and caches like in your neighborhood or not that far. That can be really fun to look at. Then our playlist for just for fun, we included a lot of what does food look like on different continents? What does school lunch look like? What do cookies look like? What does breakfast look like? It's just neat to have kids be able to go and see how other people live in on different continents. And then we have some coloring pages, some maps, and we have our planning pages. And then we have our quick looks at the end so that you can go okay. through. You don't have to fish through and figure out where on what page that list for animals on the continent is. And then this is just, if you find any errors, please email me and I'll fix them. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I plan to keep them updated. And so as things change, they'll be updated in the, in our resource library, but that okay. is what, that's what our playbook looks like. So the summary is Kate's been super, super busy <laughs> and we all get to benefit from it <laughs> and happy new year. <laughs> <laughs> It's a great way to start the new year. And I absolutely cannot wait to see in the membership how everyone is using the playbook. Yes. Kate, you're pretty great. But the people that are the most creative on the planet are in this membership. Like Absolutely. <laughs> like I said before, I want it to be something where you know, I feel like a lot of times homeschool curriculum and homeschoolers on Instagram, you feel like you need to have more. And, and this is a lot of things that you can do just with a computer. It's great. All right. I can't wait to see what everybody's going to do with it this month. It'll be I fantastic. can't wait either. Thank you, everybody. Have Thanks, a good guys. rest of the Bye, week. Vanessa. Bye. That's not the only thing that's new for no. this month. Although it's definitely a major highlight of what's new. You have one more thing that you're offering out there for all of us. We do. I'm really excited. Kajabi, which is the portion that houses all of the printable documents and the replays. If anyone's taken my courses before, that's where my courses are. I've been working with Kajabi forever. Kajabi came out this year with something called a private podcast. We took every replay that we've done for every single event in Never Board Learning. And we have 12 of each a year, guest event, day in the life, Q and A. We took every replay and put it in audio form. Anyone who's on an annual plan, which we're now calling premium, it's just a fancy word for annual, that will be automatically included. If you are paying for your Neverboard membership annually, if you go to your portal right now, it should be there. Your podcast shows up in most, if not all of the most common podcast apps. You go in there and you get a link that you then put in your podcast app and it automatically populates. I announced this in the group and there's been people who have gone on and downloaded and already started listening. This is the playlist. This is what you would see in your podcast app. This is Apple Podcasts. There's 60 currently. This will show up on your phone. And these are the notes that you would see in the replay area. What we were hearing from lots of members over the summer and surveys is it's so hard to sit down when you're a busy homeschool mom and watch something that, you know, is 30 minutes to an hour. Podcasts are so accessible because you have them on your phone. You can stream it in your car when you're running errands, you get out, it's pause. Later on, you're doing laundry. You can start it back up again. It just makes the pause it pause is the biggest deal I yeah. hate to say that, but it's like when you go in just to do a replay on video and then you have to start all over again, cause you got mm -hmm. kids came in or something happened and you got way late about 15 minutes in. It's like the, like, trying to scrub to get to the place where you were and fast forward and then you go too far and then you got to go back. Yep. Just having a pause. I can pick up where I left off. Perfect. Exactly. Let's do it. So if anybody missed any, and I know that a lot of people have, and they have every intention of going back and they want to hear Brandon from Science is Weird that we had on in December and so good. December so busy, you can just go on here and you get the audio file as you would any other podcast. That is live now. If you are a monthly member and this is something that you know that you would like to have access to, you can just send me an email and we can upgrade you for premium members. We're going to do a bonus event every month.